I'd like to develop the subject of the Sabbath with you in the next 12 lectures, I believe it is, uh, more or less chronologically. In this uh, uh, non-prehistorical age, I'm a great believer in the historical approach uh, to matters theological and other matters too. And this morning I'd like for us to concentrate on God's Sabbath prior to the creation of Adam. That's where we've got to start. First of all, let us read a few passages of Scripture as a necessary background, because I believe that if theology is not rooted in the Scriptures, it's absolutely useless and downright dangerous. And we need to recognize that uh, God was in a kind of active rest prior to creation. You turn with me then, first of all, to John chapter 17. John chapter 17. You'll notice what Jesus says in verse 5, speaking to his Father, And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory. That's the operative word. You can put a ring around it. Glorify me with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. So the Father and the Son, and by implication the Holy Spirit, were in a state of glory prior to creation. Now, Moses, when Jesus Christ, the second Adam, rises from the dead, he says to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, Ought the Son to have suffered all these things and not to have entered into his glory, into his rest, his Sabbath rest, the rest of God as the second Adam? So from this I think we can deduce, it's purely deduction, that the triune God was in an energetic rest prior to creation. Second, I give you Acts 15, verse uh, 18, I believe it is, known unto God are all things uh, from the creation of the world, pointing to his active eternal counsel prior to creation. And then, more specifically, getting into the meat of what I want to say this morning, you'll turn to the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, Let there be light. And there was light. Then we read later, verse 26 through 28, that God created man as his last creature at the end of the sixth day. And having done all of that, Genesis 2, verse 1, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day. The word for rest there in Hebrew is, of course, Shabbat. Uh, he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made, and God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. And now finally, if you'll turn to Hebrews 4, you will see that God rested so that man too may ultimately come to rest in that creation rest of God. Hebrews chapter 4, and then we'll start with a lecture. Verse 1, Let us therefore fear, lest the promise being left us, of the, in the New Testament, of entering into his rest, which you'll see soon, has been prevalent from the very end of creation, the creation of Adam, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, the Old Testament Israelites. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest. As God said, I have sworn in my wrath then, of course, the Hebrewism, I will no longer be God if they, being disobedient, shall enter into my rest. Although the works, and of course the rest of God, were finished from the foundation of the world. For God spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, quote, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, quote, I shall no longer be God if they, the disobedient, shall enter into my rest. 
Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, into God's rest, but they to whom it was first preached, the Israelites, entered not in because of unbelief. Again, God limiteth, determines, a certain day, saying in David, Psalm 95, Today, after so long a time, as it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus, that is Joshua, had given the Israelites rest when they arrived in Canaan, then God would not afterward, in the time of David, have spoken of another day. Conclusion, verse 9, There remaineth therefore a rest for the people of God. Marginal reading, there remains a sabbatismus, the keeping of a Sabbath. Sabbatismus, sabbatizo, the frequentative, the frequent week-by-week -week keeping of the Sabbath, as opposed to merely resting in the finished work of Christ. It's that too, but it's far more. It's not just a catathousis, it's sabbatismus. There remains, therefore, the repeated keeping of a Sabbath to the people of God. For he that is entered into God's rest, that is the Lord Jesus according to his humanity at the end of his life, but by implication, it's the Christian believer too, that enters into the finished work of Christ, having been saved, he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his, let us, who have been saved, labor therefore to enter into that rest. We're in the rest, we're in the finished work of Christ, and yet we're not fully in the eternal rest yet. And that's why we need a Sabbatismus, a repeated weekly Sabbath rest, even though we're saved. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, let any man fall after the same example of unbelief, and I may add, after the same example of Israelitic transgression of the Sabbath, for such they did in the desert. Now, against that biblical background, let us plunge into our subject. Today, the matter of Sabbath keeping, particularly in the United States and most other highly industrialized country is becoming, countries, is becoming more and more problematic. It becomes problematic to you and I as to whether we should or should not turn on the television set on Sundays between attending worship services. Whether we should travel on the Lord's Day and if we do, under what circumstances. Uh, whether we should go and walk in a zoo to admire God's creation on the Lord's Day if we've got to pay to get into that zoo. Uh, whether we should buy uh, refreshment, unnecessary refreshment, on the Lord's Day uh, from a person selling it to us as opposed to a Pepsi-Cola vending machine. Uh, whether we should read the Sunday newspapers with their chiefly godless content on the Lord's Day. So the matter of whether we should keep the Sabbath or not is extremely important. Now, I guess there are four basic positions of people that like to consider themselves as Christians relative to how we should keep the Lord's Day, the Sunday Sabbath. First of all, there's a Seventh-day Adventist who says, Ah, but it says the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. And the rest of Christendom, of course, is keeping the wrong day. Therefore, it isn't keeping the Sabbath at all. You must keep Saturday, or more precisely, the 24 hours beginning sunset Friday through sunset Saturday. That's their position. For all people of all races, of all religions, of all time. Over against that, you've got what I should call the hyper-dispensationalist position, which denies that the Sabbath was instituted for all men in the Garden of Eden, denies, in fact, that Adam ever kept the Sabbath at all. It was merely proleptically mentioned, this is Paley's theory, God rested, sure, but he didn't require Adam to rest then, and this was, after all, merely Moses writing the account in the Israelitic dispensation, and prior to the Israelitic dispensation, whatever that is, uh, there was no Sabbath keeping by men. And of course it was purely for the Jews, and it was nailed to the cross, and we're not Jews, we're Christians, therefore we don't have to keep the Sabbath at all. It may be useful to go to church on Sunday, but if we're living in the state of Israel, we could go to church on Saturday instead, and if we're living in Egypt, we could have our worship services as Christians on the Muslim Sabbath on Friday. So it's purely a convention that we meet on Sunday. And it may be good because the Lord Jesus did, after all, rise from the dead quite accidentally on what was, in fact, Sunday. So much the dispensationalistic position. Then the Roman Catholic position, which, of course, is much more scriptural than the dispensationalistic position. I hope we realize. 
which says, uh, well, of course, uh, the Sabbath does really need to be kept by all people because all people descend from Adam, but not with that peculiar rigidity with which uh, Old Testament Israel kept it. And after all, the church has the right to alter not only the day, and the church, as opposed to the risen Saviour, did alter the day, because the church receives the power from the risen Saviour to alter the day, and to prescribe a less rigid form of Sabbath keeping now, not only less rigid than the Israelites had, but even less rigid than what Adam had in the Garden of Eden. So much Rome. So, when you get out of the early morning mass, quite in order to go and uh, visit Reno, Nevada, and uh, have a few goes in the casino, that's quite an appropriate way of spending the Lord's Day, provided you're back for benediction in the evening. And then finally, we have the only true position, of course I'm biased, I'm prejudiced, and I'm bigoted, and that is the Reformed position. And by reformed position, I mean the classical Calvinian, Knoxian, Westminster confessionistic position, which says that the whole of Sunday and Sunday alone is to be used in religious exercises, accepting only works of necessity and mercy, uh, even between the morning and evening services that you're attending. And this is the position that I am geared to, and I uphold it. Uh, because it is uh, uh, qua tenus, inasmuch as it agrees with Scripture, but even more because it is queer to Scriptures, because the Westminster Confession's position is exactly what the whole Bible teaches on this subject, the Bible properly interpreted from Genesis through Revelation. So I totally repudiate the trash that is coming out of Holland in particular today, people like Mr. Kohler, the New Testamentician, who uh, are adopting what is really a dispensationalizing form of Reformed theology uh, in saying that Sunday is not a Sabbath and that the real thing on the Sabbath is not so much resting, it's not so much abstaining from labor, it is uh, rejoicing in the work of the risen Savior. And as long as you rejoice, and of course you can rejoice on a picnic on Sunday afternoon too, well, that's fine and dandy. That is not the position of the first Calvinists. It's not the position of the Word of God and it's certainly not the position of the Reformed standards, including, by the way, the mildest of the Reformed standards on this matter, which is the Heidelberg Catechism, which specifically calls Sunday, notice Sunday, the Sabbath. Sad is it not when men who have given their word to uphold the Heidelberg Catechism undermine it while claiming to uphold it. So the matter, you see, is extremely important and relevant to us today and distinguishing between the true conservative reformed position on the one hand and the heretical so-called milder reformed position in itself unreformed I want you to know, spell out my presuppositions to start with or my propositions, whatever you want to call them without becoming apologetic that I stand on the Westminster Confession because I believe it is what the Word of God teaches here I stand, I can do no other so help me God and if I'm wrong show me from the Bible where I'm wrong and I've gladly changed. The solution as to which of these views is correct, Seventh-day Adventist, Dispensationalist, Roman Catholic, Classic Reformed, or modern heretic so-called pseudo-reformed, uh, can only be determined on the basis of the Bible. Romans 4 verse 3, what saith the Scripture? So let us plunge in and find what the Scripture says about the rest of God prior to the creation of Adam. And then in the subsequent lectures, we'll take it from there through Revelation 22. Now, the Bible teaches that the triune God has rested in himself from all eternity, prior to Genesis 1, verse 1, while he nevertheless meditatively considered his everlasting counsel. From eternity unto eternity, he is the Lord, Psalm 90. Uh, Christ prayed that he as man may be glorified with the glory which as God he had with the Father, the Sabbath glory, before the world was. And known unto God are all his works from, and even before, the very beginning of the world. Uh, lest you think I'm speculating here, let me read you, if I may, what Bethink, a great Dutch theologian, in the good old days when Holland still did produce legitimate theologians, they don't do any more, I'm afraid. Uh, what they think tells us about the rest of God prior to creation. Now, they think says, God is immutable and above time. 
In God, rest and labor are one. God's self-rest is an undisturbed rest and eternal peace. He neither sleeps nor slumbers, neither grows tired nor weary. Work belongs to his being. He cannot but work. He always works. Therefore, he did not first begin working at creation, but his works are from and unto all eternity. The personal attributes of God are the imminent and eternal works of God, and the communion of essence between the three persons of the Trinity is a life of absolute activity and absolute rest. And let me quote my friend Karl Barth, one I'm not given to quoting at all, and very rarely given to quoting with approval, but in a lucidum intervallum, in a more sane moment, he made the following correct statement. Prior to the, cre to the creation, there is only God's pure being at rest and at movement in itself. Church Dogmatics, Volume 3. So then, it seems to me that God was in active rest prior to creation. Then God created his first creature, time. At the beginning of time, God created the heaven and the earth. And without becoming too technical, we can perhaps distinguish five stages in creation, but I'm not going to be dogmatic about that. The creatio prima, the first creation, Genesis 1, 1, uh, then the creatio secunda, the second creation, when the Spirit of God moved over the face of the already created primeval creation. Then what I shall call the creatio tertia, the third creation, which is the work of the six days, six days, which I think probably only started when God spoke, let there be light. At least it seems exegetically to be the case as I study this, but I'm not going to be dogmatic on it. If you wish to believe that the first day of formation began in Genesis 1-1, I shall not argue with you and call you a heretic. I merely say that I think there are other exegetical indications in the Hebrew text which suggest the viability of an alternative. Then we get what I shall call uh, the creatio uh, quarter, the fourth creation, which is God's rest on the seventh day from all new creative work in sustaining forevermore uh, his crea creation beneficently, and then we get finally what I shall call the creatio quinta, the fifth creation, the day of the Lord which I shall create. Malachi 3 and 4, the Yom Yaveh, uh, Osher, Ose, Oni Ose, uh, which of course is the day of the Lord, the Lord's day, the Yom Yaveh, the day of the second coming of Christ, God's eighth day that follows his seventh day, coextensive, it seems to me, with the history of man. Well, now, for purposes of this morning's lecture, I only wish to concentrate on the creatio uh, tepta and, uh, um, and, uh, and quinta, uh, quad, uh, quarta, I beg your pardon. In other words, the work of the six days and God's seventh day rest in this work. Notice uh, that God has providentially upheld this universe from the beginning. Providence didn't just start with the seventh day. God has been working and resting even from the beginning in his providential upholding of the universe. Notice that the work of formation of this world of ours, as opposed to the rest of the universe, uh, is a work of six days. And now I don't want to go into the length of time which these uh, six days took. Uh, whether we're with 24 hours or 24 seconds or 24 centuries, we can talk about that later if you like. Uh, I don't think it matters terribly much as far as Sabbath keeping is concerned. The point is that God uh, worked through a period of six days doing work that he could have done in just a flash of a, of a second to set up an example, a sevenfold cycle which man, his image, who resembled him, would follow. I personally believe that man is the small scale model of God. He is the microscopic image of God and does things on a microscopic scale which God does on a macroscopic scale. So too probably the weeks of man as opposed to the weeks of week of God in formation. Small scale model resembling, uh, chronologically similar, and yet uh, on an altogether different scale, a finite creaturely scale. Then finally, we are told at the very end of God's formation week he created his last and most glorious creature Adam the father of us all so much more important than an angel I hope you're not one of those semi-Roman Catholics that believe that angels are more important than men they're not they're merely ministering spirits 
which means it was such a rotten, low-down thing for Adam to obey a lesser creature such as an angel, a fallen angel, in sinning. He should have lorded over the angels from the word go, but that's another story. So God rests in his creation of man, who alone is called the image of God, and uh, then, of course, God creates a woman, and the woman rests in man, which is why marriage, particularly in the book of Ruth, is regarded as a rest for a woman. And then in this restful situation, at the end of the sixth day, God's big Sabbath rest begins, and he invites man to come up and join him in the Sabbath rest of Almighty God. Now, the purpose of man. I'll go into this a little more tomorrow, but one or two words about it now. Psalm 115, God gave the earth to the children of man. Isaiah 45, uh, God did not create the earth to remain uninhabited, but he created it that it may be populated. This, of course, ties in with what I call the Dominion Charter, and which uh, our friends in Toronto, in my judgment, less scripturally call the cultural mandate but nevertheless an important part of the work of man on earth to be fruitful and to multiply and to fill the earth and to have dominion over it. Now, this important work was only to be done six days per week. On the seventh day, Adam and Eve were to stop subduing the earth and to give glory every week to the Creator. So we see then that God rests from his work of six divine days of formation in the creation of the crown of crea creation man as his last creature made at the very end of the last working day of God uh, as his own image and as the peak of the whole creation process then we find that God's seventh day begins God rests from his work of formation and the fascinating thing about the Hebrew text there, check it and you'll see it is so, is that whereas we do read, and it was morning and evening, the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth days, you never read in the Bible, and it was morning and evening, the seventh day. Why not? Well, if you take the Bible uh, as strictly as I think we should take it, you will not accuse the uh, Holy Spirit of having forgotten to supply the words there. Uh, they were omitted for a very good reason. And the reason, I think, is given to us in Hebrews chapter 4, that God rested once and for all from creation on the seventh day, and that creation, uh, pardon, that uh, rest of God, that seventh day never closed. It stretches down through the whole of subsequent history. Uh, it was not a 24-hour day, no way. It uh, stretches right down... Uh, past the time of the Israelites when they are invited to come into that rest of God but refuse to do so it stretches down through the earthly life of our Saviour who as man as the second Adam was invited to uh, earn unlosable everlasting life uh, which of course he did and then donated to us and having earned that life to enter into the rest of God which he did and it stretches down even beyond that point even to 80 or 85 A.D., long after the cross, when the book of Hebrews is being written, when the inspired writer of the book of Hebrews says to saved born-again Christians, well now, the rest of God is still here, and those of us who have rested from our sin in the finished work of Christ must now have this weekly sabbatismus, uh, week by week, and labor for the rest of our life here on earth there's the dominion charter again six days a week to enter into that glorious sabbath rest of god at the end of time when jesus comes again that's the rationale so it seems to me that the seventh day of of uh, god lasts right down to the very end of history and will be followed by the eighth day of the lord the yom yaveh the day of ever morning and never evening, God's eighth day, which in principle, of course, broke through when Jesus rose from the dead on the eighth day of the week. But that's a few lectures ahead, so let's not go into that now. We're still back in the Garden of Eden uh, before Adam was created and when Adam was created. The conclusion, then, is that God is still in his seventh day, in his Sabbath rest. God desires that man, his image too, should enter into that Sabbath rest, the rest of God. 
Because God did not make that Sabbath of Genesis 2 for his own sake, but for the sake of man. We don't believe that God was tired, exhausted, at the end of such a puny work for him as to create the, the entire universe and to ordain the world and everything in it in six days, whether they were days of 24 seconds, 24 hours, or 24 centuries. In fact, the Lord was probably invigorated and just raring to go still further by the time the seventh day came around. Why did he rest? Not to replenish his strength, but he rested to set an example for man, his image, to follow him on that pattern. Now, man is built on a sevenfold pattern. And is, is that way because he is the image of God who formed this earth of ours in, on a sevenfold pattern. As Jesus says, uh, the Sabbath is not made for man, but man, uh, uh, pardon, a man is not made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath is made for man. The Sabbath is made for the well-being of man, and let me add, the Sabbath is made for man. The Sabbath is not to be disregarded by man, and if man does disregard the Sabbath, uh, he ultimately creates all kinds of psychological and physical problems for himself. A lot of people that end up in a nut house, I think, are just plain physically and psychologically exhausted because they've been Sabbath breakers their whole life, irrespective of whether they're so-called Christians or not. And the real therapeutic value is to teach them to work hard for six days a week and to rest hard on the seventh day thinking about the Lord. I don't know that we're likely to get this therapy in a hurry, but if we do, I think we're going to recover a lot of people from the uh, asylums of the world that shouldn't really be there. Just as God formed this earth of ours in six divine working days, and after that entered into his rest from creating of this world on the seventh day, so too must man the microscopic small-scale image of God form and fashion and subdue this earth in the labor of his hands in six human working days and after that rest from his human labors on the Lord's day on the Sabbath uh, he must till the ground for six days and worship God on the seventh and this man should do week after week after week until finally at the end of his life's work and at the end of the weeks of his life he rests from his cultural task of forming the raw materials of the world into cultural products and then enters into the great Sabbath rest of God alongside of God now let me just say at this point this does not mean that man gets deified. We do not break through the time barrier, ridiculous thing that we can ever transcend time. Sad that some so-called Calvinists are teaching this old Roman Catholic heresy of Thomas Aquinas again. We can never transcend time. That's why, to be pedantic, I'd prefer to say we never really get eternal life. I'd prefer to say we get everlasting life. But we never share in God's eternity in the sense that he has had it from everlasting. We do get a quality of life that we can never lose and that will constantly recur that's true but uh, we will remain creatures unto all eternity even on the new earth to come that is why the rest which God entered after forming the world in six days is a kind of a rest relative to creation somewhat different from the eternal rest which he always was in prior to creation which you and I will never enter into it is the rest of God in creation and in man as the crown of creation that we are to enter into I'd like to refer you here regarding the work of Adam before the fall and our work too after the fall to the great Boswell's systematic theology volume one particularly the last section where he develops this very beautifully and uh, I'd also like to refer you to Revelation 3 uh, without being speculative I think this is an infralapsarian reflection of what Adam was required to do before the fall uh, behold I stand at the door and I knock uh, and I would come into the man that opens and sup with him a while and he with me the idea of Christ having supper with us and us having supper with the Lord 
which of course is primarily eschatological when Isaiah 25 we will all of us congregate on the mountain of the Lord and drink that good old wine and uh, the must uh, on the coming day of the Lord at his great supper and of course we have an, a pre-announcement of that in the Lord's Supper but something similar it seems to me was intended by God when he created Adam Adam you work hard for six days and then have supper have the communal meal with me every seventh day until finally you uh, have passed through your period of probation on earth finally uh, you have passed from the losable everlasting life with which you were created to unlosable everlasting life which is your eschatological goal and then you will sup with me unto all eternity I think this ties up too with what St. Augustine so beautifully said and we all know it the heart of man is restless until we find our rest in God so to Adam Adam had the rest he was created with it but his ultimate rest the unlosable rest which he didn't have but had to earn through God's grace that was something that was only waiting for him eschatologically uh, lest you think that these views are too novel may I read you what a good Scotch Presbyterian not, not a Dutch reformed fellow but a Scotch Presbyterian wrote about this a hundred years ago godly we three Church of Scotland preacher called Kelman I just want to read you uh, some of the headings uh, that he makes uh, God's resting does not imply weariness or fatigue on the part of God it does not denote idleness or inactivity on the part of God it denotes that God ceased to create on the earth new orders of beings no new creature ever created after man it denotes that God had satisfaction and delight in the world which God had made and especially in man as its head although God's resting was relative to man it did not terminate in man but in himself because God's resting was relative to man therefore its continuance depended on man's bearing the character and fulfilling the purpose for which he was intended God's resting in man was a basis for man's resting in God God's resting in man was an invitation to man to rest in God by resting in God men enter into God's rest man's true blessedness and glory are inseparably bound up with the enjoyment of this rest well that seems to be it uh, just one statement that he makes there that seems a little strange we wonder whether it's altogether correct that God's rest was contingent upon man resting in God on the one hand we know that God rested from creation and that the fall of man did not shatter God's rest uh, yet on the other hand it does seem to have disturbed the harmony of God's rest in creation which is why the Lord comes to the Garden of Eden immediately after the fall to restore the rest through the promise of the second Adam the seed of the woman our Savior Jesus Christ throughout the Old Testament we get this theme recurring that the temple and the tabernacle which prefigured the coming Savior are referred to as the place of the Lord's rest where is the place the place of our rest and God desires to find rest again in a better and a second Adam who will remain in the rest which the first Adam broke and he finds this of course in the Lord Jesus Isaiah 11 when the Spirit of the Lord comes and rests upon him anoints him in baptism and he's the perfect Adam who enters into the rest of God and who fully perfects God's creation rest I think that's about as much as we can say about that notice that God's seventh day at the end of history will be followed by the new day uh, the day of the Yom Yaveh the day of the new creation on which God will continue to unfold his rest uninterruptedly and man will fully and finally and completely enter into that rest this is the, the day of the Lord the eighth day the day after the second the day of ever morning never evening the day which I create of Malachi the day which comes and it burns like an oven the day of the son of righteousness who shall arise with healing in his wings which he did in principle of course on that lesser eighth day Easter Sunday when he rose from the dead now let me wind this up before creation God was therefore in an eternal rest after the six days of formation God on his seventh day rest in creation and in man as the crown of creation goes back to that eternal rest 
not that he ever left it, but now resting in an actualized creation, uh, a formed earth which did not actually but only potentially exist prior thereto. Now God is restfully waiting for his image, man, to enter into that unlosable Sabbath rest of God in his creation. Man as the image of God and the crown of creation must cultivate the cosmos and then, together with the thus cultivated cosmos, enter into the cosmos embracing Sabbath rest of God. That will be God's new day, the day after his seventh. And then God and man will both rest in creation on the eternal day, the eighth day. Uh, after uh, six days of labor. Um, and so, you see, we can as much as say that Adam was created at the end of the sixth day uh, prior to the fall, if we want to call that, uh, uh, that Saturday, and then the next day, God's seventh, but the first full life of Adam, first full day of Adam's life was the Sabbath. So, prior to the fall, Adam's weekly day of rest fell on the first day of the weeks of his life and not the last day that's something that occurred as a result of the fall and was restored to the first day after Jesus Christ as the second Adam brought us back to what Adam had prior to the fall and by the way forward to what Adam never had but should have received had he never fallen at all I'm running out of time which is unfortunate but let me see if I can just read you quickly what Abraham Kuyper wrote uh, Kuiper says the scriptures point to a certain rhythm in the life of God first rest thereafter a creation week of six days and thereafter a seventh day which became the Sabbath so notice God first rests then labors for six days and then rests again he was a good Sunday keeper if I can use it that way prior to the fall uh, this looks forward to the time says Kuiper when sin shall be no more then the life of God's elect will progress uninterruptedly according to the march time and the rule of the life of the Lord. Uh, you'll also find that uh, Suckler, my time's up, says the same thing, that the whole Bible is one system of sevens. This you get particularly in Leviticus 23 through 25. Seventh day Sabbath, the Sabbath month, the Sabbath year, the Jubilee year, and that the whole of time is structured in the sevenfold manner. When man disturbs his rest, we find that... Uh, um, patterns of illness show a change for the better or for the worse every seventh day periods of pregnancy not only in man but in every other creature are always in terms of a week seven day period or a portion thereof a bee's eggs for example and this will take us to Revelation 11 through 13 indirectly uh, hatch in three and a half days uh, and so we see that the sevenfoldness is instructurated into the very fabric of God's creation and we break it at the expense of our own health this then is the rhythm of the triune God himself first rest then six days of divine labor and then rest again this is what you and I are to reflect as his image how do you and I rest tomorrow I hope to no it will be later today hope to develop this further with specific reference to Adam before the fall and tonight to show how this was kept after the fall and prior to its re-promulgation to the Jews at Sinai. Thank you very much.